pastor's dilemma, and um, I hope all of you read it. If you haven't read it, you need to get one, one of the church bulletins and read it, because uh, Dr. C.D. Cole brings out what a pastor's dilemma is, and it, he's, he's, he's right about it. Uh, it is a pastor's dilemma, and, and it has to do with a pastor getting up and preaching to pews that has no one in them that when they, someone should be there. And you need to read it. It's good. It's a good, it's a good l- little article. All right, Proverbs, the ninth chapter. And I want to read, I'm going to read the whole chapter at this time. So just listen to us as we read it. Now, this is going to be a two-part message. I'm going to preach the first part of it this morning. And I'm going to preach the last part of it uh, after lunch. He says, Wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens and cried upon the highest places of, of, of the city. Whoso is simple... Let him turn in hither, as for him that wanteth understanding, she said to him, saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and and live and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner giveth giveth, giveth to himself shame, and he that rebuke a wicked man Give himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instructions to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase his increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy day shall be multiplied, and the years of the life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if, thy, but if thou scornest, thou, thou alone shall bear it. A foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple, and knowing nothing. For, he, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. To call passengers who go right on on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of it. Thank you, Lord, for the many, many things that you do for us each and every day. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come out today to be into thy house. We pray, Lord, that you bless them as they're here. We pray, Lord, that they'll gain understanding. And, Lord, that they will uh, go out saying it was good to be into the house of the Lord once again. Go with us now and take care of us, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, if you, if you looked at the church bulletin, I put in it, God is great, in big letters. God is good, in big letters. And so, this morning I'm going to preach on God is wisdom. God is wisdom. This whole scratch, uh, chapter here is talking about, actually talking about God, but, it, but he's called wisdom here in this. So when you, when you see this... When you begin to understand it, then you need to see that wisdom is referring to God. And and we're going to talk about the feminine use of it uh, there uh, in the scriptures a little later. In this chapter, we have not only the call of wisdom, but also the clamorous sale of folly. You know, verse 13 speaks of, uh, of, of those who don't listen to wisdom. Verse 13 says, A foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple, and knoweth nothing. Now, that's 
That's not necessarily referring to any particular woman. That's not referring to any particular uh, person who puts her wares out there. This is, this, is, this is referring to those who will not listen, those who think they know it all, those who care about, only care about themselves, and they have their own opinions about everything. That's the picture that Solomon is bringing here concerning this foolish woman that he's referring to, using her as an example of, 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 of a person who is foolish in their ways and foolish in the things they do, uh, using as an example. The foolish woman seeks uh, to imitate her who is the expression of the wisdom of God. The workings of God will always have their counterfeits by the workings of the devil. There's never, there's not anything, nothing taught in the Bible, righteous in the Bible, that hasn't been counterfeited. It's been counterfeited in many, many different ways. So I want you to understand that as we study this. Um, the devil is a deceiver and the God of all who seek to deceive. The truth leads to the heights of heaven while the other leads to the depths of hell. That's, what, that's how he ends. That's how he ends this scripture. He, he, during, during this chapter 9, here he talks about what are, what, what are the heights of heaven. He talk, what are the heights of heaven? And then to the last part of this scripture, he talks about what are the depths of hell. And he ends this with, with uh, her guests are in the depths of hell. That is, people, people who have their own opinion, about their own thing and they won't listen to truth when it's preached because they do have their own opinion. People who will, who will uh, go just to judge, they, they, don't go, they don't come to church for the right reasons. They come just to judge. They come to just to look people over and, and to see if there's anything they can find in there that they can judge people as a result of. You know, and so that's that's really the gist of this whole chapter. Now, if, if we are to understand the wisdom's provisions, then we must see some things. First of all, we must see the house she built. She says up here in, in this, uh, says that uh, uh, wisdom hath built her house. Now, some uh, uh, wisdom is represented in the feminine sense here. Now I want you to understand this. Now, uh, if wisdom is God, then why is it referred to in the feminine sense? This is in relationship to God and everything which belongs to God. You know, when, when you talk about anything you talk about, uh, anything that you're thankful for, or maybe not even thankful for, it belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. That's, what, that's why God is, is wisdom, because everything belongs to God. Everything God talks about belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. You know, it's, it's, it's not about me. It's not about you. Everything is about God. It has absolutely nothing to do. Some people say, well, things aren't fair with me, but it, it's still about God. The God, God is the one that that watches over every human, every creature that he created. I don't care if it's right down to the smallest ant. God watches over them. He watches over every creature that he's created. He watches over every person that he's created. Some of you might say, well, uh, what about a lost person? He watches over them too. Because that, uh, when, when God gets, when, when a man, when a lost man gets done, and he leaves this world, he goes to his place, and then God, somewhere in, in the New Testament, God gives them the reason why they're in the place they are, and that's because they're not saved. That's because they, they, they never followed the Lord. They never followed the Lord in anything, and, and that's the reason that when he says down at the very end of the chapter, he says there, and her guest are in the depths of hell. Uh, so God is, refer is referred to in the feminine sense in the fact that everything belongs to God. Wisdom belongs to God. 
Grace belongs to God. Mercy belongs to God. We're going to talk about some of those things in, in just a little while. All those things belong to God. They don't belong to us. They belong to God. We, we're merciful because God was merciful with us. That's, that's the reason we're merciful. You know, if God hadn't been merciful with you, you're not going to be merciful with anything uh, out here in the world or in, in any, any other person. You're just not going to be merciful. Wisdom is represented in the feminine sense here. It is a house, what it refers to, that she hath built her house. It is a house of refuge and of safety. It's a house of rescue, refuge and safety. Now, when, when, we, when we begin to talk about this, it, this is a, uh, it, not only is it a place, let me say this, not only is it a, place, a house of refuge and safety, but it is a place of, of, of holy and heavenly fellowship. That's, that's, that's what this house is about. When she built her, her house, the, it is represented in the worship places through the Bible which belongs to God, the tabernacle, the temple, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of it belongs to God. There's none of it that belongs to man. It doesn't belong to anything. Man has nothing to do with it. It all belongs to God, and, and that's, why it's rep that's why the church is represented as she in the Bible, because she belongs to God. Wisdom is represented as wisdom in the Bible because she belongs to God. It belong, it, everything is referred to in the Bible in the feminine sense because it belongs to God. You know, we, we talk, some people talk about, well, the Bible only talks about men. No, not always. It doesn't always talk about men because it does talk about women uh, in, in, in a lot of places in the Bible. So the tabernacle, the temple, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is large, that is the house that she built. It is large and in every way, Filled, fi I'm sorry, fitted for its great purpose. The tabernacle was fitted for its great purpose. So that over six million people, some believe that somewhere between six and ten million people of the Jews in that day, so they had a place to worship. So the tabernacle was a gigantic place. It was a place that, that was built to, to, to receive everyone who went into it. Well, the same way with the temple. The temple was built that's to, to, for anyone that goes into it. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ was instituted because it has no limit as to who is a member of it. It has no limit to that, who, who is a member of it. And, and so it's something that, uh, to understand it, we have to understand this. Um, it, it, and and it, it perfectly becomes the character of its builder, who is Christ. All, all of those that come, the tabernacle became the character of its builder. The temple became the character of its building, its builder. The church becomes the character of her builder. And so that, that's why the Christ is the one that built the church, and the church that takes on his character. Turn with me Ephesians 2, if you would, for just a moment. In, in Ephesians 2, and, and I want to read over there in, in, in uh, Ephesians 2. He says, uh, beginning in the 19th verse of Ephesians 2, he says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for habitation of God through the Spirit. That's a church. That's a church right there. You know, it, it, it's, it's built... It's framed together, and it grows into a unity of fellowship. It grows into a unity of fellowship that all that, that, the, that the Lord's people can gather together, and they can come together. You know, uh, the, the tabernacle was a one-time place. The temple was a one-time place. But the church has many places. 
The church has many places. You know, you, you, you've got the Lord's church. I, I, some of you, I, I wish that I could get all of you. Brother Ed wrote a book, a book that none of you have ever seen because he gave me a copy of it. He said no one else he's ever given this to except to, he said he used to give it out to his students when he used to teach them. But um, as a matter of fact, they use it as a textbook in some of his classes that he taught. But, but anyway, uh, he wrote a book on about all the churches in about 20, 30 different nations overseas. And, and, and huh? And, and, and I asked, I asked Brother Ed, I said, how did you do that? He said, I went over there and I stayed over there. And he said, I wrote this book. He said, I, I went around. And he said, I tried to find every church that would belong to the Lord in these countries. And he said, I went around, and he said, I wrote about them. And, and I said, how long did it take you? He said, he spent about five years of doing nothing but putting this book together. A very scholarly book. That's right, that's very scholarly. And, and he put that book together, and it, it's something else. I had it out the other day reading it. Uh, it's, it's just something else. So, but the church now, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's, it, it's everything that he says over here in, uh, uh, in the um, book of, of, of uh, Proverbs. Everything he talks about there is, is she, she built her house. And, and that, that was a house of refuge. Well, the tabernacle was a house of refuge, was a place that God could come and worship with, uh, they could go and worship with, with their God. The temple was the same way. The temple was built that the people would have a place to go and worship with their God. Well, the church is identical to that. The church is identical to that. The church is a place where God has his people go to worship him. And, and, and that's, why, that's why he built the church. And, of course, the church uh, uh, today has taken on a whole new thought about it's, it's not even the same thought the reason God built of what is called, some people call the church today. But the church was built for the people that, that are a part of it, that, that are in it. That's the reason the Lord uh, built the church. Over in 1 Peter 2, this is what Peter says about it. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, Peter says, Ye also, talking about these saved people there in, in the, uh, uh, in, 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 during his day, ye also, as, li as li lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know, when you, when you take your time to come to the Lord's house, that's a spiritual sacrifice. When you, when you take time, you know, I've had people tell us. I remember uh, Brother Kendall and I uh, visited a man one time, and, and the man said, uh, he said, well, he said, I would come to church. He was a member, Friendship Baptist Church. He said, I would come to church, but he said, Sunday's the only day I have off to rest. And I said to him, I said, well, Sunday is going to church is not any rest. And what he said was, he said, yeah. He said, I'm talking about staying in bed and resting. And so, you see, it's, it's a place of rest. The, the Lord built these houses as a place of rest. It's a place of refuge. That's wisdom. That's what wisdom, that, that, that's the wisdom of God. You know, the tabernacle, the temple, and the church was because of the wisdom of God. That's why God is wisdom. There's nothing God does that is not necessary. God doesn't do unnecessary things. God doesn't go out here and make unnecessary things. Just like the foolish woman he speaks of down there in our text. He talks about the foolish woman who, 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 who knows nothing. She knows nothing. She knows nothing about, uh, about what God has provided for his children. And so what does she do? 
She goes about to blaspheme it. She goes about to talk bad about it. She goes about to talk, uh, 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 to talk about things that she shouldn't talk about. And he says, and in the end of it, he says her guests are in the depths of hell. Her guests are in the depths of hell. And, and so that's why it's important. That's, to me, that's why the church is very important. Now, if we are to understand wisdom, I'm sorry, if we are to understand wisdom's provisions, then we must see the pillars which hold up the house. What does she say? It says she had hewn out her seven pillars to hold up the house. It's a gigantic house. Now, to take seven pillars, as a matter of fact, uh, the temple had seven pillars. The church has pillars, but they're not physical pillars. They're not, they're not uh, physical pillars. They're spiritual pillars. Now, pillars have, have, a, have an important thing. If, you, if you're going to build a house, you know, if you don't, if you don't use something to shear that house up, to keep it up, to keep the top from falling in on you, then uh, you, you've got to put some pillars in there of some kind. Well, the Bible says when she builds her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars. Pillars always represent strength and stability. It was a great apostle Paul who said that the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The pillar and the ground of the two. 1 Timothy 3.15. What, what does a church uphold? The, what does the pillars of the church uphold? They uphold the truth. What is the pillars of the church? Uh, your pastor, what is the pillars of the church uphold? It upholds the truth. You know, you're one of the pillars. You're one of the pillars that you're going to learn later on, maybe this afternoon, we'll preach the rest of this message, this afternoon, you're going to learn you're also something else, as, as they mention here uh, in the scriptures. But, but you're, you're the pillars. You're the upholder of the truth. You're, you're, the one, you're the one that holds the truth high. You're the one that holds the truth up. And, and if, you, if, you don't, if you don't want to do that, then you're not one of those pillars. You're not one of those pillars. You, you're, you're only somebody who is just really just holding up other people from doing what they're doing. I, I preached one time on, on, on people who, uh, who, um, who go against the gospel. Well, you know, a lot of people who don't want to uphold the truth, they, they go against the gospel. They go against the gospel of Christ. They hinder the gospel, the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you're a hinderer of the truth, then, uh, then you're, you're one of those uh, that he speaks of later on. Seven is the perfect number from heaven. Seven is a perfect number from heaven. The building is both is, is built and supported by the one who is perfect in character, that being Christ Jesus. There were 12 pillars upholding the temple and seven pillars in the church. Twelve pillars that uphold the temple and seven pillars in the church. Number one, the first pillar is God himself. God himself is the first pillar. God himself was the first pillar in the tabernacle. God himself was the first pillar in the temple. God himself is the first pillar in the church. He's the first pillar in the church. What does he say? What does he say? Uh, uh, one of the scriptures, the scriptures in the 16th chapter of John says, he will guide you into all truth. He's an upholder of that. God will guide you into all truth. Not Paul Jackson. Paul Jackson only preached what the truth is. God is the one that guides you into all truth. He's the one that gives you the understanding of truth in us. So the first is God himself. The second is mercy. Mercy. Without mercy, then without the pillar of mercy, then, then why, why would anybody even be serve the Lord if God didn't have mercy on them? You know, if you're here and saved today, God had mercy on you. You know, because you deserve to go to hell, but God had mercy on you. 
I mean, that's, that's, that's the second pillar that upholds. The third pillar is grace. Without grace, you wouldn't be saved. Without grace, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here today in the Lord's church worshiping him without grace. You wouldn't be here today worshiping him. The fourth one is long-suffering. One of the greatest pillars is long-suffering. But you'll notice all of these are God. Everything is God, long-suffering. Uh, God, God is long-suffering toward us every day we live. So that's, that's one of the great pillars of the church. You know, God teaches us. He says, I'm long-suffering. Then you should be long-suffering. You, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be ready to jump at every chance to judge everybody that you shouldn't be judging because you are to be long-suffering toward men. You're to be long-suffering, especially toward your brothers and sisters. You're to be long-suffering toward them. And then five, there's, a, there's the abundant. The fifth one is the abundant in goodness and truth. That, that's, that's a great pillar. Great pillar is goodness and truth. That pillar is what upholds the church. Is goodness and truth is what upholds the church. When a church goes away from truth, it's lost one of its pillars. It's one of its pillars that's rotted away. When, when, when a church goes away from mercy, one of its pillars is rotted away. When a church goes away from sovereign grace, one of its pillars is rotted away. And so it's not long until there's no more pillars to hold up the truth. That's what's wrong today. A lot of churches today, there are no pillars to uphold the truth. Pastor doesn't do it. The members doesn't do it. And so the church just goes into what's called liberalism. And back in my day, back in the, back in the 60s, you called it modernism. We didn't call it. We called it modernism. You know, when churches began to go the modern way rather than the way of the Bible and the truth of the word. The sixth one is having mercy for all who come to visit wisdom. Having mercy, you know. If you go to God, God will give you mercy. If you, if you ask of God mercy, God will give you mercy. So that's what the, the seventh one is, that having mercy for all who come to visit wisdom. What was it James says? James says, if you lack wisdom, go to God. He's got it for you. Because God is wisdom. God is wisdom. Go to God. God's got, God's got, you'll say, well, I know what I want for my life. God knows better what you need for your life. You might say, I know what I need to do in life. God may know better what you need to do in life. You'll say, well, I'm happy all the time. Are you happy all the time? Or is there things that gets in the way of your happiness? A lot of things get in the way of your happiness. And certainly that's, uh, that's one of the keys to it. And the seventh thing is forgiveness of iniquities and sin. That's, that's, a, that's the seventh pillar that is in the Lord's church. The seventh pillar that is in the Lord's church is the forgiveness, iniquities, and sin. I mean, why would I be up here today preaching to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ if God didn't one day forgive me? Why would I forgive others if God didn't forgive me? Why, why, would, I, why would I go about uh, 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 at teaching you that you should forgive, you should, you should exercise forgiveness in a lot of things. That's why Jesus himself said, they asked him, they said, well, how many times should we forgive? And Jesus said, uh, 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 always, in other words. He says, uh, I'll be seven, uh, seven times up on seven, something like that. You know, every time someone comes and asks forgiveness, you forgive them. You say, oh, I can't forgive them for that. They did something terrible. Forgive them. When they ask for it, forgive them. That's the key to it. One of my statements has been all of my ministry is kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. 
How many times have I had people say, well, you're just being good to me. Kill them with kindness. In, in that seventh pillar, you may be here today and don't think the church is very important. And, and I'm sure there's some that doesn't think the church is very important. But I'm going to tell you it's the most important thing in your life if you're saved. You know, if you're saved and you've been scripturally baptized into the Lord's church, that's how you get into the Lord's church, is be scripturally baptized. Then uh, the church is not very important to you. The church is an important place. Why? Because it belongs to God. The, the, the church is not called he, it's called her. Her church, her. When, when you refer to the church, you refer to the church in a feminine sense. Why? Because it belongs to God. When you refer to wisdom, you refer to it in a feminine sense because it belongs to God. When, 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 when you refer to grace, you refer to it in the feminine sense because it belongs to God. It belongs to God. It, 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 says, it says in our text, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She being wisdom. Being belonging to God, which is great wisdom, which belongs to God. Now, I'll get to this point, and I'm going to stop for this morning because it's already a quarter till. But anyway, he says here, if, if, we, if we are to understand wisdom for vision, then we must see the sacrifices which are made. The sacrifices which are made. The Bible says she hath killed her beast. Verse 3, verse 2. She hath killed her beast in our text. Verse 2 of our text. She hath killed her beast. Wisdom made her sacrifices. Wisdom made her sacrifices. Ample provision could only be made by the shedding of blood and the fourth, the fourth fortitude, I mean, the forfeit, uh, for for, I can't even say the word, of, of an innocent life. Forfeit an innocent life. That's the only way. Only way you were saved is blood was shed. Jesus forfeited his own life for you. So you could be saved. Well, it's the same way with, with, with everything. You know, she, she had killed her beast, which, which is a picture of blood and, and picture of innocent being killed. This lesson was quickly learned by Adam and Eve when God would not accept their fig leaves as a covering. Adam and Eve hid from God. God said, why are you hiding from me, Adam? Adam, where art thou? Why are you hiding from me, Adam? And he steps out, and they've got fig leaves over their lower part. And God says, what have you done? What have you done? When I created you, you didn't have those fig leaves on. When I created you, 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 you didn't have those fig leaves on. What have you done? Why did you put those fig leaves on? Why are you all of a sudden ashamed of yourself? And the truth came out. Eve was deceived and ate of the forbidden fruit. And she took to Adam. And Adam, Adam uh, took a... The, took a a bite of the forbidden fruit, and as a result of it, they became ashamed of themselves. If you're here today and you've sinned against God, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. Some people think that just uh, everything they want to do, everything they want to do is just okay. It's not. Not everything you want to do. That's, that's that foolish woman that he talks about. The foolish woman that has her own opinions about everything. That foolish woman who it leads to uh, the depths of hell. Her opinions lead to the depths, the, the depths of hell. But, but there's a lot of people out there listening to her opinions. Her opinions. You know, the world directs and drives... 99% of people today, I don't care if they're called Christians, 
The world is the one that does the directing of them. The world is the one that, 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 uh, that teaches them the way they should go and what they should do. It's foolish to go over to Landmark Baptist Church. What, what, what do you gain by that? That's foolish, you know. You could, be, you could be out here doing something. You could be at the lake. You could be at the, at, the, at the beach. You could be here or there. That's what the world says. It says it's foolish to have to go to church every time the door is open. You'll say, how do I know that? I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it said many times over the years. It's foolish to have to, to think that you have to go to church. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something like David Collier said. You don't have to go to church. You only go to church because that's what you want to do. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to go to church. Nobody has to tell you you have to go because you don't. You go to the Lord's house because you want to go to the Lord's house. Because that's where you want to be. Because you want to be serving your Lord. And you want to be upholding your Lord and honoring his name. That's the reason you go to the Lord's house. You don't, you don't go there for any other reason. You don't go there because grandma and grandpa said you need to go. You, you don't go there because mom and daddy says you need to go. You go there because that's where you want to be. These young people, you know, once they get out on their own and they come back to church, they're here because that's where they want to be. I can't help it. It is. That's, they're here. that's where they want to be. I know Carson, Reggie and them, you'll be, be thankful, you know. I remember Carson said one time, he said, I don't mind going to school, but, but he said, I hate it because he said, I want to be in the Lord's house. Carson said that. I want to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. You're here because you want to be here. Carson can find every excuse in the book not to be here. But he didn't do it. He, did, he doesn't believe it like that. Yeah, I've talked to him. He's talked to me. She built, she, she has killed her beast. Adam and Eve learned that lesson. When he, when he saw them, they had the fig leaves on. He said, what have you done? And, uh, and God knew they had sinned against him. They knew, and God told them, says, God went out, and, and, and God killed, a, uh, God killed a, a beast, and he provided for them coats of skin, the Bible says. He had to shed innocent blood in order to cover their sin. That's a picture of it. That's the reason I said in the Old Testament, the New Testament reveals the Old Testament. That coats of skin there represents the fact that God killed a living thing in order to cover Adam and Eve's sin. Well, he did the same thing with you. God gave his only begotten son. He gave, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, he forfeited. Isaiah says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Again, Isaiah says, he hath put him to grief. Why? Why did God do his own son like that? How many of you would do your own son like that? How many of you would, would put your son up to die for somebody else? How many of you would do that? Well, that's what God did for you. We're so sorry sometimes that it. We're so sorry sometimes that it's 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 a wonder God don't take it all back, but He won't. He won't take it back because God has mercy. He won't take it back. No, no way. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Isaiah fifty three and verse ten. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah 53 and verse 10. In this sacrifice by the Father, the Son, and the Son 
there is no pouring out of divine love and divine life without that. There's no pouring out of it. God poured out divine love and divine life, each one of his children. Wisdom hath done it, but there are those intellects of this day who will vehemently deny it. They'll deny it. They'll deny it. I, I got a uh, great gut fail on, he, uh, some of you know, if you, if you watch Fox News, Greg Gutfeld said he's not a believer. He said, I'm not a believer. He, he, he said, I'm an agnostic, which means he's not a believer, which he doesn't believe in God, which he doesn't believe in any such thing as God. But yet he wrote a book that thousands of people have already bought. He wrote a book that hundreds of thousands of people will probably buy. What's it about? His life. What's it about? His adventures. Well, let me tell you, I haven't written a book, but I'm going to tell you this much. I've had a lot of adventures in my life. And they've all been good. God has been good to me. God is great. He's been good to me. And he will be good to you. He will be good to you. All right, let's all stand if you would. and We're going to sing a verse of song. You know, we'll pick up this message. I've got about four more points yet. Four more things I want to talk about in this message. Seventy nine. 